Greetings, ladies and mental gents, and welcome to the latest chapter of Oz Magica, taken from the subreddit HFY. All the relevant links are down below, and please like, comment, and subscribe like any good minion of the algorithm would do. And as always, I hope that you enjoy. Chapter 61 Ah, goddamn, my head hurts. What? Huh. Oh, this is familiar. Wait. Don't tell me. Yep, uh, eyes are just goddamn blind to the darkness again. I would have figured that some of the lanterns would still be around. There's nothing. I check my map functions and... Oh. Oh, crap. I'm sitting entirely within red. That's not good. Plus, all the previous mapping that I'd done is just completely gone. The only thing here is just a corridor that I can't see in the darkness. I try to figure out how the hell we ended up in here. But I'm interrupted. And there's a little flash that appears in my eyes before a ball of light is floating in the air. And I have a sudden clarity as to where I am and exactly what I'm standing on. This cave isn't exactly a cave. There's no hallmarks of rock and stone pillars jutting out from the ceiling or ground. No water drips silently running through the air. It's, um, I suppose the closest thing that I can think of is hospital. I mean... I know it's not a hospital. The air, while clean, doesn't exactly have the same smell of alcohol. The floor, while checkered, is entirely made of metal. And while their walls and doors, they all seem welded shut. Fake. Also, there's no ceiling. There's that, too. However, my attention from my surroundings is drawn to the wreck further away down the long corridor. There lay the remains of the carriage. Like it fell out of the sky and tried to fit some place which was too small for it to exist. I have absolutely no idea why I'm so far away, or why the ball of light seems to be fading, but I have to get to it fast. If the light is fading, it is either a magic issue or a life issue, and I'd rather it not be the second one. So, quite haphazardly, I get off the floor. It's a little sticky for some reason but I managed to get up after a couple tries. Running, kind of, has the same problem, but it is less hard to do. It's mainly the sensation that you'd get it if you'd step on dried soda on concrete or linoleum. By the time I'm able to pass the many fake doors that actually reach the wreck, the light has almost gone out completely, only giving off a faint glow to its immediate surroundings. And there, sprawled out underneath it all, is calm here, free, of her restraints, but completely conked out. I hesitate for a minute before moving aside the rumble. She may be a slime, but I don't really know if she's... Oh, oh God, she's bleeding out. Or is that her magic? No, not really the point. I begin to bring her up, but the floor is also sucking her in like it did me. It took a fair bit amount of effort for me to pull her out, but when I did, I noticed some of the slime came off of her. Crap! Uh, and it's gone. Okay, carnivorous floor. Explains why pulling sensation. And oh god, I'm going to be sick. The whole floor is... No. Everything is moving. It's like all the metal is just a fleshy acid. Okay, so I could... Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's no problem. No, don't freak out. I've pushed the spell out to other people before. Maybe. Well, only Kojo, I suppose. But does it double their rate, or given the double mine? No. Stop overanalyzing. Just try, damn it. Regenerate. My spell takes shape, covering my entire body before shifting over towards Carmia. Her lost slime seems to come back, although it is not as fast as I'd hoped. Guess it only gives twice their regeneration. However, with an activated, I can keep up for a while, at least until she stopped bleeding. I swing her around me before tying her arms together around my neck. She's a little bit pliable, and I think there's no problem with it since I've seen her do it without bones. She's tied up there, and her feet are also touching the floor and being dragged down. I grab them quickly and tie them around my waist before putting my attention back to the darkness of the hallway. The light has now gone completely out, but there's a red glow coming from the windows and the door. That's certainly not ominous at all. And now there's a knocking sound. Great. Found myself in a horror movie. Wait. That's not coming from one of the doors, though. 
I pulled myself together and followed the sound towards where Marwal was apparently, gotten himself lodged into the wheel. And the sound is him trying to get free, no. No, no, you can't laugh, no matter how much he looks like Bradley right now. Marwal, you need help. My voice seems to echo down the corridor quite loudly, and I freeze as I realize that anything could have heard us at this point. My question seems to pull him away from smacking it with a hammer towards me before nodding briefly. Okay, don't move your head and twist a little bit. Yeah, so your ears are near the inner and outer spoke. Now we'll pull at the same time. One, two, three. Marvel followed my instructions to the letter, slowly twisting his head and pulling it at the same time I had. However, the quick pop sound was unexpected as I fell onto some more of the wooden rubble. Ow, that hurt. The reddish light seemed to grow briefly in intensity before going back down to a gentle glow. That's not creepy at all. Okay, Marwal seems fine. Wait, should warn him. By the way, uh, don't touch the floor or the walls or uh, anything that looks metal. Whatever it is, it just sucks you in and causes constant damage. Almost sucked in Kamiya's legs here. At that, I waved at the jetty on my back a little, and Marwal nods before heading over towards the edges of the wreck that he can still stand upon. Seeing him like that makes me think of something, especially with the Axel over there, and, uh, huh. Hey, uh, Marwal, do you have any nails to go with that hammer? His ears seem to perk up a bit before he looks towards me, nodding and pointing towards his fallen over sack. I gently meander my way over to the broken wood and twisted metal to find a second question, grabbing it and making sure nothing else is loose around it. Thanks, um, if everything goes to plan, we might just have a way we can all safely traverse through here. Quickly, I try to load myself up on any non-broken wooden planks, or at least the ones that have the least amount of splinters coming off of them. I lay them down in the raft pattern with one wood being overlaid by several other planks. Basically, I just continue piling on wood into a square before pounding nails into the junctions so that it is a solid square sheet of wooden floor. Once that's done, I head over to the one unbroken axle and grab it. And oh, that's... Uh, oh crap. I think this whole floor is just a lot more dangerous than I thought. There, lying underneath the wheel, is an empty shell. An empty, familiar shell. It, uh, it completely ate Rollaram. It's not even bones left of the thing, just, uh, oh god. What kind of monster am I if I can't just stand on top of it and feel the slightly itchy? No, you're not going to self-deprecation mode right now. Lives are on the line, even if they aren't yours. Shaking my head away from that funk, I grab the axle, feeling the strange shifting sensation along with it. Crap, it can spread to other metal. However, as long as no one with metal touches... Oh, I really hope that Credence and Kojo haven't gotten sucked to wherever this is, too. Putting that string of thoughts away, I manage to make it stick towards the bottom of the flooring. I have to add a bit more wooden board so that the axle isn't going to just burn through the wood away when we move it. Along with that, I do some quality of life changes, adding some boards around the whole thing to create a fence and making sure that there is a tub to put Kamiya in. I don't really know when, but I know eventually she's going to end up being liquid again. I untie her from the waist and neck while setting her down in the little wooden tub before getting off on my creation. I stepped back from my work and looked towards the slightly amused Marwal, who had managed to find his backpack and pick up at least some unbroken supplies while I worked on this, judging from how it was slightly bulging. Ta-da! It's a rickshaw. Well, probably not a good one, but hey, I did the best I could with what I had. Marwal seems to be silently chuckling before heaving his backpack over the side and crawling after it. Once he fell over the edge, he looked up from the floor and looked like he wanted to ask me a question. Oh god, communication with him is going to be tough now. There's literally no earth around us at all, and his papers and tables are probably gone somewhere in the rubble. Guess I have to interpret what he wants to say. I get it, buddy. We'll find something for you to write on later. 
He seemed to be somewhat angry, judging from his spur rising slightly. But he nodded, almost mollified. I hooked myself up to the rickshaw and carefully making sure the rod was well and truly attached. Then I turned myself towards my cargo. So, um, which way do you want to head? Marwell seemed to consider something before pointing ahead towards the source of more red glows. I looked behind him to see the glow was slowly but surely fading away. All right then, hang on for a minute. It's going to be more bumpy before we get it smoothed out. Slowly, I began to push us along over the various bits of bobs of wood dotting the floor. Before we make it past the entirety of the wrecked cart, I look back towards it to find Marvel looking backwards at the encroaching blackness before it all seems to be swallowed entirely. I can barely make it out as the slighting, but the floor underneath him has spots of wetness. I look back towards the continued corridor ahead, letting him have his moment. He probably lived inside that place for a while. Seeing it go, I can only equate it to losing a home. As we travel on in silence, I start to question our surroundings more and more. There is literally nothing around us, and the only sounds that I can hear are the steady breathing of my passengers, the metallic churning of the floor as my feet hit it, and the wind going through my ears. Hmm. Something certainly strange here. Analyze. For analyzing a high-level target at the threshold, Analyze has evolved into Critical Eye. Critical Eye cannot gain any details upon the target besides the name, the Buried Legion. Huh. This place must be extremely complex if it pushed my Analyze towards the next breakthrough. Wait. What are the changes? Critical Eye. Cost, zero AP. Your eyes have seen a lot along the road and they can tell quality from the mundane to the legendary. They can sense the strength of an opponent much higher than you, and find their ultimate weakness. They, however, have also been trained to see the past of an object, the actions which have led it to your viewing. No, then while there is no cost towards using critical eye, it can be pushed to the beyond its limit with the correct application of magical might. That uh, is definitely more powerful than before. Can't even level it anymore. So I guess I got the best observe that I could have gotten. But what's its benchmark? What can it do better than what Analyze has done? I can test it on Marwall. Or maybe the cart. No. Marwall's a better choice. I know things about him. And if it doesn't put down what I think I might put down, then I know I got chipped. I turn my head back around and aim true. Critical eye. Name, Marwell Lancaster. Race, Bast, Clane. Class, Merchant, Level 45, 3,700 out of 4,500. Noble, Level 38, 2,500 out of 3,800. Monk, Level 1, 0 out of 100. Titles, Mute, Merchant of Mysteries, Lost Child, Hidden by Magic, Runic Genius, Pure Aristocrat. Level 122, 8,700 out of 10,800. HP, 10,370. MP, 6,222. AP, 10,000. Strength, 34. Dexterity, 21. Constitution, 85. Intelligence, 92. Wisdom, 45. Charisma, 72. Affinities, none. Description. Marwell Lancaster is from a family of nobles that has held in high rank amongst the socialite ladder. His family was perhaps the longest living noble line in the history of Gonsong, possibly the most legitimate line to the throne if the main one would ever depose itself. He spent most of his life trying to reach the epitome of noblehood until he met the most impactful teacher in his life, a sage for a monk-type class. He wanted so bad to get into the class, he took it to the first chance he got. However, Further advancement was blocked due to negative title modifiers he had, and the official organization he wanted to join would not let him in for the exact same reason. Frustrated, he ran away from his home, hoping to find someone to get rid of his title for him, or at least figure out how to deal with it for himself. To this day, he's traveled under the guise of Marvel the Merchant of Mysteries to better market himself towards the classes he thinks might have the solution to his problems. Oh, that's, uh, that's quite interesting. 
and also maybe a brief invasion of his privacy. He's been lying, or at least I've not seen the full picture before with my previous scanning methods. I mean, one of his titles is hidden by magic. Plus, he gave me levels and inspection. Don't know why that happened. Maybe I can. Oh yeah, I can just adjust this kind of like my interface so I can see what I want to see instead of what I don't. Now, I won't have to invade anyone's privacy by mistake. However, this lets me see the stats of people and other things, and while that's interesting, that much info can sometimes make my head gush. However, as that thought passes through my skull, and my vision turns back towards the front of the cart, and into a slightly red darkness, I can't help but ask myself, where am I, and what is this place? Question chain received, automatically activating knowledge of the world. Question deemed within restriction level, subcategory, knowledge of the gods, HP reduction necessary, contact with center panopticon necessary. Limitations regarding uses replied, zero out of one. Basis of question, knowledge of the buried legion and dungeons, general answer. The buried legion is a relatively new project for Daryl, god of dungeons and prisons. He had wondered whether it was possible to make it so that a dungeon's affinity could be based around constructs. Thus, the Buried Legion was made with the affinity for golems. It has recently gotten into contact with a bide that has helped its growth in a staggering ways, in exchange for a price. Its current size is 19 floors. Dungeons are part of the designs of Hypatia, that pertaining to the imminent, either becoming amendment or gaining knowledge, they were not originally part of the world until Daryl had decided that he wanted to have a bigger importance upon the world despite his namesake. Some say that he was simply not happy being the patron god of prisoners and the tortured. So he brought dungeons into existence once the rest of the gods favored towards the new classification system for most sapient life. He made it so that they can operate on manner and fusion to grow bigger and stay healthy. In order for the manor to subsist, he had to make it so that it could grow each time that something dies within them. In accordance, he was forced to assign and create prizes for those who do not die within the dungeons he creates, as well as let the dungeons decide what prizes are worth their well-earned manor. Dungeons basically do not exist in the world proper, as they reside in little pockets of reality, only ever encroaching upon the world in terms of their entrances. Thus, Certain skills pertaining to reality are somewhat altered by the transference. Because of this, dungeons can basically appear anywhere at any time, given that their growth conditions are usually specifically geared on the individual level of a dungeon, and the things that it can summon forth, that being traps, monsters, puzzles, and sometimes other bite. Entrances that are part of the dungeon always push individuals towards the first floor, unless they have a keyed-in waystone that the dungeon gives out at periodic times. Some entrances blend in with their environment, while others lie in wait to swallow unsuspecting passerbys whole. In the case of this dungeon, it was just a sudden growth period, and it was not expecting. Dungeons can be killed or exited once the final door has been reached. Usually, every five floors within the dungeon is either a rest floor, where one can retrieve a waystone, or a singular effort from the floor to dissuade you from going further, often through elaborate puzzles or strong summons. Remember, the general goal of a dungeon is to trap you inside it and kill you to absorb your mana. Some do not care if they die within them, though, as while you're able to leave, there is no great loss to them, as any skills, abilities, or items which use mana can have their source be pulled from them while they're still being used. The purpose of the dungeon is for the eventual summation of reality itself, as Daryl will be able to control it through his domain of prisons. Other gods do not think that this will work out, despite his somewhat optimistic attitude towards it. Gain 10 PP for answers difficulty. Reminder, use of knowledge of the world will not be available for the rest of the day due to being under the subcategory Knowledge of the Gods. I... Uh... I did not mean to activate that. Plus, sir, uh, I can't use it for the rest of the day. Ugh. There could have been something more important, actually. This might have been the best use of it. 
even if the knowledge just went straight into my head once I read it. So somewhere out there, Kojo and Credence are on the same floor, which I guess I wasn't all too worried about. But I guess I'm a bit worried considering that the Mecha Lobster might have... Uh, no, don't think about it. Gods are far above where you are, and you probably can't even comprehend of how it is all. Just uh, focus on saving your friends from something that wants to feast on them. Yeah. Anyways, pulling the cart is kind of an issue if I want to save them fast. Even with speed activated, it doesn't really move all that much. Maybe I'm just pushing the cart wrong. I know that the other rickshaws usually have their bars higher up, but mine's at almost the exact same level as the rest of the cart. I can try pushing upwards, but I don't know if I... For carrying a weight exceeding 100 kilograms, you've received plus two strength. Oh, well that certainly makes it easier. Also, does this count as carrying? I mean, at most I'm pushing most of the cart up. Waiting, in turn, my head back, and then both fine. Marwa was a bit frazzled from the jostling, but he still is in the same place, and Kamiya is either still unconscious or being unrelentingly lazy. Thank God nothing fell off. However, speaking of strength, maybe if I had enough to actually push it where my speed would actually keep up without losing pace. Yeah, I mean... I doubt I'm going to end up doing anything that's worthy of a feat of strength now that my newcomer title got removed, especially since I don't plan on carrying people or throwing buildings. I guess it's somewhat worth a shot. But how much do I want to add? If I compare myself with Martwell, even he has more strength than me. If I want to be able to at least keep up with my current speed, I'm probably going to have to increase it by at least ten more, but uh, I'm in a dungeon now. Things are different. And though I haven't seen any monsters, I need to be able to take them out if you are here as fast as I can. I need to at least hit the next benchmark. The more power I am able to get out of my body, the better I can protect my friends, so... 18 points, and what the hell, an extra one to get 50 in wisdom. Then, leaving me with only 42 left, due to the level up for my class leveling twice. That's alright, um, let's do... For gaining strength of 50, you receive the ability Focus. For gaining 50 in all body-related stats, you receive the ability Overclock. For gaining 50 Wisdom, you receive the ability Introspective. I, uh, huh. Didn't expect that at all. Wait, this also means that I could have another skill, by like Charisma's counted as Mind Skill. I mean, yeah, but it isn't also a body one. Well, maybe it isn't a body one. I mean, unlike Strength and Constitution... It hasn't really physically changed my body at all. Or at least, not to a degree where it's noticeable. I don't think I'm going to be able to get an ability for the mind side anytime soon. Now, let's see what we've got going here. Focus. Level max. Stat ability. Strength. Cost. 50 AP. At times where the world is discomforting, chaotic jumble, your body is the only thing that you can rely on. And when it isn't able to perform to your satisfaction, all you need to do is push it. This skill allows you to focus all your strength within parts of your body. At your current strength, if you were to put all your entire strength within a punch, you would be able to hit for an average of 480 points worth of HP. Overclock, level max, stat ability, body. Cost, one stat, 10 AP. Sometimes your body isn't enough. It's been battered, bruised, and broken upon the crushing feeling that fate puts upon you. You've tried making sure that you're able to do whatever you want to do, but it isn't enough. But the world how it is, it is almost never enough. This skill allows you to place temporary stats towards any within your body. For every 10 AP that is provided, you gain an extra stat in whichever category of body you would like. No, then instead of a once-off cost like your other skills or abilities... This one instead uses them constantly while you have them. In other words, while this skill is active, that AP is essentially taken from your maximum. Introspective. Level max. Stat ability. Wisdom. Cost. You've managed to touch upon the intricacies of your inner world. For some, that would be enough. They would have been happy to have just grasped how to use magic insightfully. For you, that's not enough. You've gotten a glimpse. Your mind isn't exactly the only thing in there. Now, you just have to reach out and touch it. 
This skill currently has no effect until certain conditions are met in the future. Ah, certainly interesting that skill does nothing. I mean, the others are certainly a fair bit easier to understand, and also, holy crap, that's a lot of damage. I can do if I put 15 temporary into strength, and then I get up to, what, 625 damage? At least assuming each strength point does 9.6 damage per enemy for an average focus punch. However, my mind is brought out of its reverie towards my new skills at hand, towards the change in scenery. The walls no longer look like hospital walls. The tiled white and black had faded away to a dull rust. Well, you could no longer tell that there were even tiles along the wall. And the doors had long since faded to look like crystals, which exuded the same red glow that we'd been following for ages. And there, right in front of me, was the first crossroads that we'd come across. To the left, crystals seemed to grow more frequently, rippling in much the same way as the metal. While along the right, the rust almost seemed to permeate the air. I turned towards Marwell to speak about, uh, My thoughts were interrupted as a scream rang out through the corridor. It almost sounded like a howl. While the others were a screech in the air, it seemed to come from both directions, but it could have been one of those traps that was talked about before. My perception isn't helping me, as too far in either direction just leaves a haze. I turned my head sharply towards Marwell, only to barely noticing the stirring of Kamiya. He points assuredly towards the left path, and I go. The screams seem to be getting louder as we continue on, and I can hear Kamiya groaning in pain. As we continue on, the floor has also changed from the slight rust towards the crystalline structure that the corridor has become. My steps leave behind cracks as I pound forward. My speed has long since run out, and I'm going at my natural speed. Even... If we're heading in the wrong direction, I can't help but feel like everything's just going to get worse before it gets better. Especially since that last thought was punctuated by a groggy, almost supernatural summation of my feelings. Why am I here? End of chapter. Chapter 62 Light strewn through the cracks in his cell, lighting up the area surrounding him. Cobbled stone strewn with patches of grass were layered upon the floor, with the only thing lying upon it being him and the iron gate in front of him. Its iron had long since rusted, while the lock was all but gone. The only thing that kept him in place was the goddamned chains, their burning ice and freezing fire keeping him frozen in place. However, the pain was something which he had grown accustomed to, like an old friend. Even if the sentence had been short, whoever made them had long since passed, so the key had been lost to the annals of time and history. He was stuck like this for a while with no access to other places or locations. Then his art of arts, he had found that the situation was something that at least was somewhat funny. He was a god of prisons, eternally stuck in one. He had tried changing the contents of his prison several times, but this one was perhaps the most peaceful one that he could make. All the other variations usually had the neck or legs chained, and he'd much rather have his wrists restricted than anything else. He sighed as he scuffed away the conjured sand back towards the cobble and grass of the growing decay. He stared at a spot that was so close, yet infinitesimally far away. The gate's threshold. It was slightly ajar, giving the illusion of freedom, much like all of his other prisons. That was the one constant, beside the chains, at least. Yet no matter how much he wanted to gate to come closer, it didn't allow him to cross it. Not ever. Everything outside of the room, while he could sense it, was not to a degree that he could feel within the room. It was more like a vague sense of it. He knew the room was being held in a dilapidated castle. He didn't know exactly which cobblestones were cracked, nor what kind of other rooms were in it. But here, he knew everything to the exact detail. Which moss seemed like an aqua more than an evergreen, which cobblestones had dirt underneath, or more stone? 
which particles would be reflected within the sunlight as they twirled through the air on the currents only he could see the entirety of. All within the room he had knowledge of, except the damned chains. No matter what the effort he put into it, he only found out what they were made of, but not the specific enchantments that they were set upon it. They had long since stopped trying to figure out what they were, I decided to focus upon what he could do instead. If he was to be stuck within a prison, he might as well try to make a livable situation. Well, it was either that, or make everyone stuck within a prison, then only he would be some modicum of freedom. Then a change occurred within his domain. His room shifted about him as the chains became linked towards both of his arms instead of towards the wall. He was now on the outside looking in, a warden looking over a temporary transfer. Two gods came this time, with this rarity in and of itself. He usually tried to make himself antagonistic towards any of the would-be visitors. He would have no part in any of the grand games that were being played out in the real world. If he could not affect anything outside of his beloved creations and those within his namesake, then... What was the point? The cells contained some familiar forms, chained much like he was, except this time the chains were more of a metaphorical instance. All those who entered the beholden to him and him alone, and his domain no longer worked against him, but for him. For in this space, he was the most powerful, while almost all others were beholden to him. So... What brings the mangy dog and the soulless man to my domain, hmm? Before him sat the two most vocal individuals that he'd ever met. Well, vocal about their demands, at least. More times often than not, they'd cooperate over the few dungeons strewn about the world. They were both recompensed with faith, as was the agreement back when he knew the gimmick alone wouldn't be enough. But they always pushed him in ways that he didn't like. We have detected a person who we've had to, uh, put considerable amount of time tracking them down. Daryl nodded slightly, head tilted to the side as he stared towards the leftmost cell. There lay the most egregious of demands, the most capricious of the canis, Marank. It was a necessary evil, in his opinion, to work with the man, even if he had given up his soul for the power he held. It made sense, in a way. They almost never came together to meet him. So, if something had done something towards them, well, they'd need all the help that they could have gotten to get to him. Are oh, they imprisoned? Usually, that was all anyone had asked for his help, when it concerned something on an individual level. Justicia held up all the laws of the world and the countries therein. So, if someone had been sentenced, they, basically, no other god would be able to touch them, except for him. No, they're in a dungeon of yours. That was surprising to Marank, even if the face was unable to change due to the stony nature. The way his fingers stopped tapping against the side of his leg made it given how much he thought it was surprising. How can you tell? At that, the silent member of the duality finally spoke, shaking the grass off of his form as he stood onto his legs, still chained towards the very floor. One of mine went in there with him. We know his location, we just can't access it. Daryl had something of an idea then. Either they wanted the person dead, or they had something of import on them. In the cases of the latter, not even he could change the rules of his sons and daughters to force out their entrance, unless it was a special case of a type of dungeon. However, if it was the former, there was a possibility towards something being done. Nemigas, you want me to throw something apparently strong at them so they die? Marank nodded in desperation as he tail trying to flail at the rock walls to free himself. Monsters did not like to be caged, after all. If you are able, Onda and I can both offer enough faith towards the summon of such a thing and the additional payment for the service provided. This was adequate in Daryl's eyes. 
More faith usually meant one of two things. Either he was able to purchase a more varied selection from Wacken, who was the only merchant up here to trade with, or he could always birth more dungeons. To him, it was a win-win, especially since the collection he hauled over the years had grown more distinct in its progressions. Which dungeon does it reside in? His willingness seemed to eat away at whatever foe, nervousness, was residing within Marank, while making the other sigh in resignation. It appeared to him that one of them did not actually want to be here. He didn't hold it against him, though. Not many cared for his stony personality. It appears to be a fresh one, judging from how the entrance just opened under the road of Erend, city of Menchaloon. Daryl brought up his screen to search through the various locations which his sons and daughters lay throughout the world. He didn't exactly have a map of Reddity, though, as information of his domain was hindered quite considerably by the laws he had agreed to. It only ever showed the closest residents of Bayed Beast or any other gathered sentience. And there, where he expected it to be, was a dungeon, one which he remembered quite fondly, and realized of two things. The first was that it was a golem dungeon. He could not summon any kind of monsters within its confines, nor deal with anything else in the terms of its infancy. Perhaps, if it was older, he would be able to convince the dungeon to provide a way for monsters to be summoned in. But as was the case, it was only about two years old. The second was that the dungeon was evolving. Well, Evolving would have been too strong of a word in this instance. Dungeons were not flesh and blood which could gain the intricacies of enchantments written into the very cells. No. In a way, it was becoming more complex than it had any right to be as a dungeon. And that at least qualified it as one to evolve. Daryl couldn't exactly tell what the dungeon was trying to turn into, but he would be here for the entire process whether it failed or succeeded. Either way, he would save the core if something were to happen to it. It at least deserved its spot amongst his most loved. I cannot help in that department, I'm afraid. His brief pause before the answer into the negative was noted by both of his prisoners. It somewhat confused both of them, as Daryl never really had displayed many emotions and new behavior from him wasn't always known to equate to any of them. Plus, none had ever really been around when he felt proud of something, so there was that as well. It's not like he wasn't capable of them, but when you face this basically stone mask with eyes that were hidden in shadows, the cues were hard to find, unless someone spent an inordinate amount of time around him. May I ask why... Honda's question seemed to reverberate against the stone surrounding them, before echoing out into the hallway beside them, only stopping once they had reached far enough to the naturally quiet town. Meanwhile, Marank was almost stuck in time, face frozen in either surprise or rising fury. Either way, Daryl couldn't tell, and frankly, didn't care. This was a special circumstance for him, and if they pushed him further than he felt was allowed, consequences would be abound. The dungeon cannot spawn monsters, only golems. His brief explanation was once again brought by a pregnant pause, albeit not originating from him this time. It was a combination of both Onda's pleased looking face and Morang's silent contemplation, the faux anger burgeoning outwards in visible waves through the air. Perhaps it would have flared even further if the wall separating the cells had been made of bars instead of stones. Can you at least make them pushed out? It was a legitimate question. No one really knew how dungeons worked better than Daryl did. All that they could figure out was that it was a subsection or reality he could control. The ways in which he did so were almost always following certain rules and bylaws which he gave towards those who questioned him about it. However, those were almost always lies. Besides the typing that the dungeon could have, he literally could control every single aspect within it. He just didn't like to get any of the autonomy he could have provided for his children. It reminded him too much of his own situation. It is not a training kind of dungeon, so 
No. The answer, well expected, only pushed Meringue's rage onwards. Is there anything that you can do? With that, Daryl wrote off the scale raving guard. With a wave of his hand, the air around the lizardman stilled to an almost chilled degree before it was all but removed from the area. The god had gotten too angry for his own good, and now was no longer allowed to speak or even breathe. Gods may have been immortal, but that did not mean that some could not feel a special kind of pain. Is there an actual reason you're following him, Onda, or is it just a pretty revenge scheme that you've been roped into, like always? Onda seemed surprised at the lack of a voice from a rank, although he still answered him despite what may happen. Why do you assume that it's him? Daryl let out a scoff that sounded like a flesh tearing. The sound wasn't as surprising as when Onda had heard it the first time as other gods had managed to dispel the misconception that he had accrued within his younger years. Daryl may have looked like he was made of stone, but that wasn't the case. Or well, he was simply just encased within it. It's always him. It's never you when it comes to that kind of thing. I only barely tolerate that which you spawn into existence, inhabiting my own sons and daughters. Onda seemed to quiet for a second before nodding solemnly. He was somewhat assured of evading some Meringue's anger and suspicion if he would just not say anything on the matter at all. However, he had an idea as to what to say next that might allow Daryl some leniency. What if I said that we were doing this for justicia? At that, Daryl tilted his head once more before turning towards the muted choking Meringue. He went to talk once more, before noticing that the prisoner would not be able to answer him. So, with a snap of his fingers, and rushed back into the chamber, suffusing the scaled behemoth with much-needed relief as the choking hazard. You, my pawn. Marang, while able to hear his warden, for that was what he was while he were within his domain, was unable to speak for a bit, as a coughing fit rapidly spread throughout his body. Only when it had finally quietened to only every other breath he took, he was able to get out a sentence edgewise. Or, or less, uh, the, the person the bide were after uh, caused some undue amount of damage to her. This in and of itself was surprising to Daryl. While Justitia was the goddess of law and order, none before had ever been able to take her off so heavily that she had to send others off to the offender. Now... That isn't exactly what was happening here, but that was what Daryl's train of thought went to when he went over this new information. However, even with the added information, it didn't seem to change his mind. Again, why is this important to me? The brief question seemed to put off Meringue's flow. He had come here almost expecting everything to be handed to him. No questions asked. That's usually what it was like when he associated with the most of the dark and sometimes it was even like that for those aligned to the light. Despite that brief moment of confusion disrupting the hatred that he was trying so hard to cultivate, he managed to form a coherent thought that might bring Daryl back towards the side of things. Don't you want to get on her good side? She might have a way for you to get out of your manacles. A laugh seemed to echo out through the mouth hole of the mask Daryl wore. He grated upon the ears as the pitch steadily rose higher and higher until the cut out almost abruptly. Well, <laughs> that is a concern of mine. I've already done enough groveling at her feet to warrant that particular reward if she had it. Believe me, I've tried. Marang's rage had finally returned to him, the one emotion he could successfully cultivate without influence from others. And then the cold realization came over him. So, uh... There's no point for us coming here. The whole trip that he'd been hoping that he could finally grab hold of the stupid mortal, that he could personally give him a brand of punishment for killing those he spawned. Sure, he may have been banned from causing any mortal to obtain the title of sinner, but that doesn't mean that he wouldn't be able to touch him before he was eventually sent towards her. After all, and now it had all been taken away from him. The monsters would not be able to siphon his soul. Now that he had no chance of finding the man who faulted him so. However, 
His downward spiral into depressive state was disrupted by the gravelly voice of Daryl. I wouldn't say that. There's no point for you coming here. But for Onda, him, I'll make a deal with. Instantly, a vague sensation of hope crawled out of the abyss of Marang's husk before it was dashed with almost immediately. Me? The word of the wolf seemed to reverberate within Marang's head, causing rage to build up once more. Veins started to pulse throughout his system. Blood pumping, legs quivering, and tail thrashing occurred more and more until Daryl's response reached his ears. Yes. Instantly, Marank reared up into his legs and pushed with all of his might, thrashing against the chains again and again. Steadily, breaking them from the wall, his mind was blind to the consequences as his vision turned red towards the walking statue. That was Daryl. This is outrageous! Why I should... However, with each raise of his voice, his fate was further and further sealed, much like a person stumbling headlong through the woods until the tree popped up in front of them, with no time to react to its presence. Your sentence is over. Be gone! Marank, just as sudden as he appeared, disappeared without a trace. His cell started to recede into the wall as it was brought forward to join the rest of the hallway only ever leaving the detritus of fallen scales upon the floor. The only trace that he was ever there. Onda was shaking a bit silently from how much Marank's voice had been torn asunder from the domain so thoroughly, that he could no longer feel anyone else except him and Daryl. I always forget that you can do that. Those are the perks. Unlike others, I can force anyone out here that I don't necessarily want. I just can't stop them from coming back in after a while. At least, until I can change how the law can be broken for them. While others were within his domain, there was an inordinate amount of control he had over what they could and could not do, which far outstripped most others whenever they received visitors. He could dictate what laws there were within his domain, and whenever they were broken, he could punish them in whatever way he could think of. So when he just didn't like the attitude of someone, or someone had shown overt hatred of him, he would free them from his prison and his rules for a decade of time. With that, he could not forcibly enter, as they, in his mind, did not deserve to be put into prison. So, what kind of deal do you want with me? Daryl seemed to shake his head in derision as he motioned towards the pile of scales on the floor. Oh, that, uh, that was just an excuse to get rid of a loudmouth out here. I want you to hear the real reason from you. Honda considered something for a moment, on whether or not he should tell the truth. He figured that he should give it, otherwise he would not be taken seriously whatsoever, much like Marank was dealt with. The thing... Uh... The person we're after. They killed off some of Marang's high-class experiments. He wants revenge for that while getting on Justicia's good side. That part is true. However, his explanation as to the reasons as to why he was so mad about these specific experiments was stopped as Daryl interrupted him, telling, What about you? This pulled Onda from his thoughts, as while he had heard what was spoken, he could not understand the question. In his mind, Daryl had just jumped to a different topic entirely. What about me? At that, Daryl bent down to pick up the scales off the floor, before shoving them into a hole inside his mask. A distinct crunching sound could be heard before all returned to silence of the birdsong echoing out the holes in the walls leading out towards the forest glen. However, Daryl's focus was perhaps on how exactly the question should be taken. He decided on the main reason, that being the question on the legitimacy of the two's partnership. My follow your other half. Onda seemed to sigh before falling back onto the floor to lay on his stomach. His muzzle, while being held underneath both of his paws, still allowed sound to travel through. Could everyone please stop say that? There's a reason he's opposite from you, you know. The reminder, once again, brought her a sense of shame and anger towards his relationship. But with a resigned air about him, he once again stood back up on all fours to stare into the eyes of the one who might be able to help him. 
That person, he helped one of my own to evolve. That hasn't happened in centuries. Thus, it's a new variant, one of the Green Wilds, which is unlike so many others of mine relating to the waves, fire, or stone. I want to be able to thank him, or at the very least, bless him. This surprised Daryl. Not many gods were willing to give up blessings towards mortals, even less so if they weren't of the distinguished position within society already, or somewhat high upon the ruling caste system within the world. And from what he heard, this thing was simply an adventurer, judging by how he was fighting monsters. The lengths to which he wanted to go to thank him touched some emotions inside Daryl that he didn't think he had any more. Sympathy. I can't bend the rules for you. Even if your cause is appropriate, you know I'm part of the neutrality. I can't hold any mortal above any other. As am I. But I feel like perhaps those of us that can act in this instance should, despite which side we end up siding with. This was interesting to Daryl. From what he alluded to, blessing this person was helping a side, albeit which he had yet to tell. He guessed that it was towards the light, that there was only really one way to find out. What do you mean? I don't know if I'm able to tell you this, but I doubt there's any others that you should tell it to. There is an evil coming. At this, there was an audible groan emanating from the mask as it brought its hands to the sides of its head, slowly but surely massaging the stone hairs protruding from it. You're going to have to be a bit more specific there. There's almost always a great evil coming, just like a great hero or a villain or a natural disaster. All of these things happen all the time. What is the difference here? That only the neutral can act in a place of light and dark. What outlandish necromancer, petulant king, rabid monster, immense chasm-forming earthquakes, tsunami volcanoes, or ancient evil has been brought before the world as such that I and you have to act when they don't? Naron told me something about how souls were disappearing entirely. This... Surprised, Daryl, on multiple levels. Naron, god of history and tellings, usually would not be able to talk directly to gods. More often than not, the only communication he had between people was scripts written in the form of the Panopticon address. But the only telling of it being written by his hand was his infamous signature. There was also the other matter of souls, but at first had to wait. As in Daryl's mind... Naron was perhaps the most trickiest god to deal with when it concerned him. Naron, yes, he managed to talk to me despite his station's hindrances. In Daryl's mind, the only conclusion could be that either another god was imprisoning Naron, which isn't exactly possible considering his voice wasn't so much as heard, as felt, or that this was serious enough to get most neutral of gods to finally take a stand. This sparked an idea within Daryl's mind, something which he accidentally let slip as he thought it out loud. If he's worried about it, it must be that. You know what it is. Onda's surprise seemed to knock Daryl out of his train of thought. In a few seconds, his mind sped to possible answers that he could give towards the question, before the truth came out as the top answer. Onda never personally did anything untowards to him, so... It would be the least a good idea to treat him with the same dignity. Of course I do. Directly affects my creations. Dungeons. At that, Daryl nodded and gestured towards a screen that he had summoned so that both he and Onda could look at the information. Yes, dungeons are essentially bubbles that are lying on the top of reality. Anything that affects reality ripples through the other bubbles... I don't know where it's happening, but I do know that it's not just souls being destroyed. It's everything. Everything except the dungeons I've created. Finally, once it's done eating, I will be more free than ever, with everyone else stuck in my wombs instead of theirs. I finally have made the spotlight while having everyone else live in the dark. There is a great difference between a leader and being a tyrant. Are you sure that you wouldn't be able to know the indifference, given your nature? Naron's voice echoed through. Naron, you're here, personally, instead of spying on me from afar. Yes, 
This form was the most fitting that I could find towards the situation, even if it isn't something which I uh, own. Plus, with how it's set up, it's more than equal footing for uh, us both. Naron had made himself a little clear prison cell, with his shadowy form constrained against rest. All right, you've had my ears, but now you have my attention. Now, how much do you both know about the Unmaker? The question caught Naron off guard slightly, as he began pondering the name itself while finally having the time to write in his book. Thoughts strewn throughout his mind, letting him ponder. Perhaps I'd revealed myself to Ernie. Unmaker... Onda's voice brought Naron back to his downward spiral, focused on the important information that was disclosed. Is that the official designation for the books? The question almost seemed to cause Daryl to stutter in place for a second, before turning towards the pale manifestation. Not officially. The Panopticon can't look at it for the same reason I can't look directly at Rock. And the god who made it isn't exactly willing to lend the name out. Naron's incredulous attitude radiated off of him, much like the sun in its rays. He wasn't ever. I can't ever show emotions directly. It's not right for an author to do so when he's supposed to be as objective as possible towards the topic. Thus emotion comes off of him in palpable waves whenever he wants to display a certain attitude towards the situation, rather than physically changing his unset appearance. You know them? Not personally. But judging from his work, I don't believe he's up here, or at least not entirely. Naron tried to figure out what exactly Naron meant by that. He wasn't exactly able to enter the minds of those he focused on any more while he was within the domain personally. So he had to meander upon the meaning of almost everything that was talked about, both in terms of the now and terms of the past occurrence. However... It was also because of this that he was blindsided by a sudden noise of Onda. Is it a pet name? Onda's question was a somewhat important one. Pet names were a thing that very derogatory towards those belonging to the label of the situation. If this thing was one of his beasts, even if he couldn't fear it, he would likely not want it to be treated as such. A nickname, a concept that was recently introduced that I've grown quite fond of. Onda nodded slightly, as his head dipped into thought, while Daryl turned back towards the opaque mirage of the recorder. However, whatever he was going to say was once again interrupted by the Divine Wolf. Is this uh, what you were warning me about, Naran? Judging from the name and the details, I can assume at what it does. Naran couldn't exactly nod towards Onda, as he was currently bound, in a sense but he felt an affirmation would do well to at least build up some confidence in his plans for the future. Yes, um, the information that was stretched up didn't quite fit the bill as to how disastrous this unmaker is to the world. I only recently discovered why it is so horrendous to my very epitome. It, it doesn't just eat souls. It grinds and gnaws and bites and claws on the recesses of the worlds that's been written. Its whole being seems to cause the waves which make up the world to quite, and then disappear as if they were never there. It's not just souls. It's everything. How bad is it then? Onda apparently did not get what exactly Naron was trying to talk about here. So Naron, with the worst case scenario, that he could was attributed towards the intrusion upon the world. Somehow parts of my book are disappearing. Naron's book was perhaps the single most important aspect of his being. He was, essentially, born with it. With all the tale, story, and history from before his creation, he was as close to a parent that Naron could have ever had. It also held the records of all he remembered, and he was tied to exactly he remembered. So in other words, if the damage that book, you directly affect Naron's state of mind. With that, Naron could only hope that the others could understand the gravity of the situation, even if the things disappearing from the book were from the time it came into being and onwards. So why aren't you worried? Nonda's question was aimed at Daryl, who throughout it all had not spoken a single word. But silence, as it stands, can only go for so long. 
Daryl took a breath before sitting out slowly. Once it's eaten everything that it can eat, I will be the most revered upon all, lord of all remaining reality. Naron tried to recall something that Daryl might have cared about, but the only things appearing within his mind were two facts that he knew about the god. Won't the dungeons die off without access to the lifeblood of theirs? It was a valid question that Naron had posed. Dungeons could not survive without a steady flow of mana, and once reality was gone, so too would the mana go with it. I've saved enough faith to change their entire species on a womb. I have nothing to fear from that. That was a surprising thing to hear from both the occupants within the prison. Faith wasn't exactly something that Daryl was known for having. The stereotype is usually attributed to one who held trade and commerce, for they were the ones who invented the entire faith system. To be able to hold a lot of faith to do that, despite the constant use of it to create new instances of his namesake, there were likely deals going on neither Naron or Onda knew about. For one, it was because they held no great interest within the divine in question, while for the other, it was due to lost memories. Onda stayed silent through all of this, content to let Naron take the wheel which uh, I was not actively ready for, as it was something for which no experience was had. Naron had never been commanding presence within the Pantheon. He mostly stayed within the back lines, content to write about the events that were transpiring, for that was what he sought joy from the most. The only reason that he'd even taken such an active role within this case was that without souls, the writings that he would take up in the future would be the dullest things imaginable compared to the business he held currently. However, Naron had one last thread that he could pull, one last plan to pull into action and get Daryl's help to gather together the necessary characters to beat back the physical apprehension. I can give you something better than being this lord of all, but I would need Onda's help to do so. That had Onda perked up considerably. He most likely was not able to figure out how he could help in any of matters. He only ever held consistent mastery over things of the physical nature, so that was what he thought was the most likely situation for him to be in. What exactly do you think you can do that would change the arrangement of ours? Daryl questioned Naron. Naron gathered himself, causing the opaqueness to become a solid shade of white, becoming the most present that he could within the situation. I can get rid of your manacles, your chains, your bindings, and the enchantments that inhabit your being. At that, Daryl's interest within the conversation soared, and he vocally exclaimed with the most expressiveness that he could pull off, You lie! The incredulity wasn't wrong with its placement. Daryl had spent almost his entire existence trying to find a way to get rid of them, and he'd come up empty for reasons. Even Onda decided to chime in with a somewhat of an agreement. You know very well that it is an impossibility. How? Despite all of that, though, Daryl couldn't help but show an amount of hope within his voice. Out of all the options that he had tried, asking Naron for help never seemed to come to his mind. With the added attention towards the thoughts of those that he was talking to, Naron's form started to waver. However, the conversation was yet to be done, so he tried to hold himself together into a singular form. Onder has the secret beast he's been working on. The proclamation seemed to shock Onder out of the self-driven stupor, as he clawed at the floor in consternation. Yes, but, but it isn't ready. It is, I know it is. Naron's support seemed to make the wolf reconsider what he had been working on for the better part of a decade in secret. So, with trepidation, his claws were sheathed into his paws, and he lay down, laying out the consent. Fine. This is the biggest fiasco I've been a part of since the Great Walls. Might as well go along for the ride, so I don't end up in the undertow. With Onda's consent, Naron turned towards Daryl with a renewed confidence oozing out of his paws. What is so special about the beast? It was a sound question, but it wouldn't do for Naron or Onda to give out all the details of it. They had to have some edge over the god, else he might renege on his deal. Daryl wasn't really known for doing that kind of thing, 
but with something this important. It wouldn't do just to assume that he would respond with the prospect renewed in his heart. No manacles on their chains aren't just physical relics imbued with godly might and power. There are ties within the world itself which maintain them. In other words, even if the lock were to be destroyed, the configuration would remain with you forever, its effects unchanged due to the very nature. I am to provide the key, perhaps several, towards the one thing that you've been wanting ever since your inception. That wasn't the entirety of the truth, but it was enough to lead Daryl towards the final conclusion. Freedom. Naron nodded at the proclamation from him, before motioning towards Daryl for his final say in the matter. It would not do to assume his decision, and if it had basically already been made. I always hold my bargains. If you aim to give me freedom from my station, then so be it. I will help you. Now, what would you have me do? End of chapter. The algorithm reckons you should be watching this video next, and I recommend that you should be always watching my video. So, click and click. With energy! And yes, clicking that does help the channel. Thank you very much. I just want to give a quick thank you to the T5 members and patrons. Alithia, Barky, Fudic Yol, Cam Maxwell, Casper Arnholtz, Angry Marine, Lord Azrakel, White Van 420, and Arcalian.